He said, at this point, I need you to close yourself off to everything. He says, right now, I'm saying, what is getting ready to happen is so very, very important. I need you to shut the door. I need everything. I need your full attention. All right, so let's get to it. Verse 5 in Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which see it in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things you have need of even before you ask him. And the part that I like, he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, trust, our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Most high, I pray now that you would fill me with your spirit. Father, that you would speak through me, O King. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts today, God, and that we will receive a word from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, guys, we're going to be looking at, again, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6. And we started at verse, uh, we already read 5 already, but I want to go and concentrate mostly on verse 6 tonight. Once we get through verse 6, then we'll go on with the rest of the, uh, rest of the verses. And, again, we'll see just how far God takes us into his word. So we look at verse 6, and it says, but thou, when thou, hast, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which see it in secret shall reward thee openly. So, man, I begin to look at this thing, and I'm trying to figure out, man, what in the world is going on at this particular time? If I can just give you a little bit of backstory on it. If you look in verse uh, chapter 5, we know that this is the famous Sermon on the Mount. That God, uh, that Jesus Himself would begin to teach uh, to His disciples. Um, as we look at it, it was a time when Jesus Himself was doing all kind of miracles. He was going throughout the land healing people. He was raising the dead. He was uh, healing the sick. Man, he was doing all kinds of miracles, and it was just, you know, it, it, it was it was wearing on His body at the time. Because remember, Jesus himself, yes, he is 100% God, but he's still 100% man. And don't you know that sometime that old body get tired sometime. And it's at this point when we look at when God is breaking it down to his disciples, the Bible says in, in uh, Matthew 5, 1, he says, And seeing the multitudes, he saw all the people who was, that was there just to, to get a piece of him. The one that wouldn't stop until they was healed. The one that wouldn't stop until their child was healed. The one that needed uh, this and he, they needed that. And, and, and Jesus saw him and he loved the people and he had been working. But at this point, he needed to retreat from the people. So the scripture says, and he saw the multitude, and he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, the Bible says that his disciples came to him. So, man, Jesus is up there now. He's chilling, right? He's like, oh, man, I can breathe a little bit. So he sat down, he's chilling, and his disciples come up, and he began to break some stuff down to him. And he was like, man, guys, listen, the time that we're living in, I'm going to have to give you give you the game. I need you to have a certain kind of mindset. You know, I know how y'all been doing things for the longest, and I know we've been following the laws and doing all this stuff out of more of an external way, but right now, where we're getting ready to go and where I'm getting ready to go, it's going to have to be a little bit of a switch. So he began to, to work on the attitude. He began to tell them uh, different things. Now, we know those things as the beatitude, and he starts off like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
talks about those blessed are they that mourn and they shall be confident. So he just giving them a game. He goes all the way down and he tells them, he says, listen, guys, look, not only do you have to have the right attitude, but I want you to know that you're different. You're not like everybody else. He says, man, you are the salt of the earth. Boys, are like the salt of the earth. Hmm. I'd rather be a hot pepper or something, not just a salt. I want some spice or something. But he says, you are the salt of the earth. And he begins to, to break down to them that you are supposed to be the one to affect some change wherever you go. He says, but listen to me. As a believer, as a follower in me, and if you're not being salty or you're not affecting change, he says, you have no value to me. He says, you're not good for anything but to be thrown underfoot and to be trodden on by men. And then he goes on further down and uh, he says, man, you are the light of the world. Hey, sweetheart, how you doing? I'm glad to see y'all just walked in here. Uh, I'd already got in the middle of my sermon. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, when you're up here, you can do all kinds of stuff. Camera can't see y'all, but I love y'all. Glad to see y'all here. I know y'all had an emergency y'all had to take care of. All right. So he was talking, <laughs> he was talking about talking, you know, telling his disciples, he says, man, <laughs> all right, y'all, it's all right, man. It's all right. It's good. Hey, Pastor, you're doing it. You know, I'm just taking care of some things. All right. He talked about, man, we are the light of the world. And he tells them, he says, man, I need you to let your light shine. That men may see your good works, right? And, and see that you are different. You are there helping this one and helping that one. He says, but everything that you do, I need to make sure that I'm the one that get the glory for it. So he goes on further down, man, and he, he begins to break down even the old way of thinking. He says, man, you have heard of old that, you know, that thou should not kill or y'all shouldn't commit murder. He said, but if you hate your brother without a cause. You see, Jesus at this point is speaking to his disciples, and he, and he wants to deal with the heart. Right? All right. Ooh, I'm getting too excited, Miss Blue. Not yet. I ain't got to my, my thing yet. Just, it's good. It's good. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. He wants to get to the heart. He said, oh, he's reminding them of what happened and how they used to do things. He said, even when it comes to uh, committing adultery, he said, man, if you, if you look at someone to lust after them, you committed adultery in your heart. He said, man, look, the external things that you were trying not to do, look, I'm, I'm saying this here, I needed to be more of a change of heart. And, man, he goes on and he breaks that thing down. And then we jump over to chapter 6. All right. Now, in the beginning of chapter six, he reminds them, it's two things I need you all to work on. He said, I need you to work on your giving and I need you to work on your prayer, your prayer life and your giving. So uh, I think um, maybe a couple of times before I was here, up here, I, I covered uh, the giving part. So tonight I want to cover the prayer part. All right. And if I had to title this message, I guess it would be make prayer a priority. Sometimes, I guess, man, we can get so caught up in, you know, living the Christian life that sometimes our prayer life kind of take the back seat. Now, I'm not saying that's for everybody, and I don't know where you are in your prayer life, but when I looked at this thing, and Jesus had uh, the time that he can pour into the disciples and tell them anything that he wanted to tell them, and at this point, he said, listen, guys, I need to talk to you about your prayer life. I need to talk to you about making sure that you not only how you should pray, but making sure that, that the heart is right when you pray. So we look at verse 6, and verse 6 tells us, he says, but thou, when thou prayest. Now, brothers and sisters, tonight I'm going to break down verse 6 word by word because I want us to pull every single thing out of verse 6. So when we first look at it, we see the word but. All right? Small word, big meaning. All but mean is, or, or what but is, it's a conjunction used to introduce a phrase or a clause contrasting with what have already been mentioned. So when we look at this right here, we see that the direction that the writer was going, it got to but, and he need that direction to stop and completely turn around. What was, the, uh, what was the direction that Jesus was talking about? As we look in verse 5, we can say, we can understand what he means. Verse 5 says, what? And when thou prayest, now Jesus is talking to them. He says, and when thou prayest, thou shall not be as the hypocrites are. Now, if you notice right here, he doesn't even give a title. He doesn't give a name, who it is. But can any of my Bible scholars here, the faithful ones of Philadelphia Christian Church Lafayette, 
And on the chat, y'all can write it down to those. Or Who is Jesus talking about here? All right, I see we got two scholars in Philadelphia that has been. <laughs> no, no, thank y'all. Right, he is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the, the, the ones that's supposed to be the poster boys for righteousness, the ones that's supposed to be the, the one you look up to when you're trying to uh, live piously or you're trying to, to do the right thing and, and, and be uh, show that you are committed to the Most High. These people are the ones that, was kind of like your examples, right? But Jesus said, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Now, what's wrong with the way them boys doing their thing? When I first read it, it says, for they love to pray. Now, I'm like, man, what God is, what Jesus is tripping off? Nothing wrong with that. But the thing is, you have to look at that particular verse in its totality. And it says, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue. Now, listen to me. When Jesus is addressing his disciples, right, he is not addressing the multitude. This is strictly to the believers, and he's talking about them. He's talking to them, and he's talking more of a like, personal prayer, not corporate prayer. All right? He said that these hypocrites, these no good, these hypocrites, right, He said, for they love standing in the synagogue. Not only do they love standing in the synagogue when they pray, he says, and in the corners of the street. The boy standing on the block. Hallelujah. No, he's probably not saying hallelujah. Hallelujah. Me. I am great. Look at who I am. Look at what I have done. You know. I was going to do that. <laughs> This is the thing. He's saying, don't be like them. He says, I don't want you going out there and, and, and trying to pray all loud, trying to make sure you use the right words, always trying to sound eloquent, all right, or use the, let me see one of the big words, proper elocution. Is that the right word? That's, that's right, elocution. Uh, Y'all probably don't care. Anyway, this is the thing. <laughs> he was warning his disciples. He said, look, man, I'm, I'm not calling you to be religious. I'm not calling you to, to, to go out there and, and do this thing pretty much for show because he called them hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Hypocrite is basically an actor, someone posing like someone else. He's saying, man, what them boys are doing, man, they're acting. They're acting like they're praying to me. They're acting like they are excited to, to, to be in a, a so-called relationship with me. He says, listen to this. He says, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street. Why do they like that? That they may be seen of men. The whole time they're doing this, all they're trying to do is to see how much attention can they get. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, man. Whatever you do, and you're doing this thing for me, make sure that you're doing it, that I may get the glory, not you. All right? Sometimes we'll get caught up, and we know the right words to say. We know to, to use the right uh, Christian, Christianology, I guess you can say, the, the, the right things, but we, sometimes we're we doing it kind of in the wrong way. So Jesus is saying, look, that they may be seen of men, and he tells them, verily, verily, I say unto you, guess what? They have their reward. Now, what about the Pharisee that maybe possibly needed his, his light bill paid? But he out there talking horizontally instead of vertically. When he's talking that some men can say, oh, he must really be in the church. He must really be in the spirit. Man, oh, Lord, look how he's praying. And guess what? When that prayer comes up to God, well, it probably don't even get that high. It just come, he hit rejected. Bam. Wrong one. Here come the next one. Oh, heavenly father of God. Bam. The next one come up there. Elohim, Hidonai. Bam. They're coming up there. Why? Because their heart is in the wrong place. When Jesus is talking to his disciples, he says, man, listen to me. Your heart is what I'm concerned with. Men judge the outward appearance, but God judges what? The heart. So we come on down to verse 5, and we understand, I mean, verse 6, and he says, but, so that but, that it was the idea of, of them uh, doing external prayers only to get praises of men. But the next word we see in verse 6 is thou. All right? 
In the King James Elizabethan terminology, we really don't say thou anymore, but that is speaking of you. All right? Who is the you that he's talking to? He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his followers. He is talking to the ones that have put their trust in him. This writing right here is written in red, so that makes me say, you know what? Even though I am not there with them, this writing is for me. Because why? I consider myself a disciple of Jesus Christ. I consider myself one that follows him. I consider myself one that has put my trust in him. All right? So it says this here, but thou, all right? And he says, in the next uh, few words, it says, when thou prayest, when you prayest. And I guess my question as I read this thing to the believers today is, when do thou prayest? Or are you praying? Another question is, is are we praying anymore? I know we are the people. I know that God has chosen us. I know we have a, a rich heritage. But as a follower of Christ, are, are we praying? The reason I pose this question is that a lot of times when you speak to Christians and you speak to believers or you speak to the so-called church folks, man, they're always stressing out. Man, they're always stressing out about this. They're stressing out about that. Man, this bill ain't got paid. This note ain't got paid. Man, this one is sick. That one is sick. And when you talk to them in the conversation, ooh, I just spit a lot. When you talk to them in the conversation, all you hear is, is a people that's filled with stress and worry and anxiety. Now, I know that's none of y'all, but it's probably the person that's sitting on the side of you. This is the thing. Jesus is saying this here. I need to reconfigurate your, your mindset and reconfigurate your ideas when it comes to praying. I need you to make sure that you spend some time and talk with God. I need to make sure that you are, are, are not just going through the motions and being hypocritical. Not that we want to be, no. Because sometimes, man, we can kind of slip into just going through the motions. You know, like myself, like, you know, when I get up in the morning, I, I automatically, I read my Bible. I'm not, like, super spiritual that I, ooh, I just, ooh, if I don't have, I just need to read my Bible. But I made it a habit, you know. And sometimes we can, we can go through the motions and even with prayer, man, we, we find ourselves and, you know, it's just, Father, thank you for this day. We well, actually bless in Jesus' name, amen, hallelujah. And we walk out the door. God is saying... When you pray, it's not saying if you pray. It's saying that prayer should be a priority in the life of the believer. He says, when you pray, he says, I want you to stop focusing so much on the things that's not going right in your life. A lot of times the things are not going the way we sh it should simply because what? We're not praying. When we look at Philippians chapter uh, 4, verses 6 through 8, it says, be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. What does that be careful mean? That you're holding a lot of care. You're weighting yourself down with the things of this world. What is the thing that you are so caught up in that, that you're, you're so full of care on this one idea? That is maybe blocking or hindering you from spending the time with the Most High. He says, be careful for nothing, but, that go that conjunction again, that means the idea that be, we should be so worried about stuff. He says, nah, that's not how it should be. It says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, what do you say? Let your requests be made known unto God. And he says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, sometimes you can't even figure it out. He says, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He's telling his disciples, man, I really need you to prioritize prayer. I really need you to get to a point where you're not doing this thing like, like the Pharisees and the scribes. I really need you to get this point that you really uh, want to seek me and you really, wanna, you really care about what my thoughts are. I really want you to get back to a, a, a time of, of prayer because, I, I mean, I remember, man, it used to be, for myself, I, I used to pray a lot more than I used to. 
And, you know, a lot of times when you get up here to, to deliver a word, man, a lot of times God himself, he wants to speak to you even before he wants to speak to y'all. I remember we had a situation, man, at our house that, that we're in, and uh, uh, we had needed a house painted. So a friend of mine, man, he was like, man, you know, we kings and priests, man. We don't need to be painting our own house and all this stuff. So he goes to the homeless shelter, and he finds these guys to come paint my house. So, all right, cool deal. So, man, we out there, and and uh, and, and got two of the guys, and, man, you know, there's some, some pretty rough-looking cats, man. So I ain't really want to, you know, holler at them too much, you know what I'm saying? I, Y'all do y'all thing. That was his idea anyway. He's like, you get them. And so, man, the day go on, and I kind of peep out at him, and they got one up, man, like he just want to talk about God and all that. Man, look, it's not time to talk about the Lord, but go and do the work, man. We, I don't want to hear nothing about no Christ right now, man. Paint my house like you're supposed to be painting the house. So every time I look, boy, he having a deep conversation with the other guy about God, and the other guy is working, but he ain't doing nothing. And I'm saying to myself, boy, your homelessness, I mean, your, your God ain't really working for you. You're homeless. And that's the thought that I had. So, man, I get over there to the guys and bring them some water. And I remember I walked up there, and I had never spoke to him at all. I just kind of waved and stuff. And I walked up there, and he, he asked me, say, man, what hindered you? <laughs> I said, boy, who you, <laughs> boy, you talking to, boy? He said, man, what hindered you? He said, man, you used to get up and pray two or three hours a day. He said, what hindered you? I said, oh, Lord, it's one of them homeless people. I said, oh, man, could you pick anybody else? I said, boy, I'm saying to myself, how did he pick these two? And, man, the guy began to tell me all my business in my front yard. He says, man, you used to pray two and three hours a day. What happened? He said, what hindered you? I'm standing there, eyes filled with water, and I'm like, man, who is this cat? And the guy, like, he almost got a whole one of his eyes over. I don't know, man, he just looked weird. <laughs> so my partner, one thing about me, I, if I got an issue or something, I'm not, I'm not going to tell, really. I don't share all of my, I share some stuff, but not all the stuff. I go to the Lord and pray about it. So my partner, he didn't know what was going on. So here come my little wife. She come home and he look at her and he say, hey boy, I'll be looking at my wife like that, boy. So he look at her up and down and begin to tell her all her business. Now she looking at me like, Phil, why are you telling these people? I said, I ain't never said nothing, girl. I don't even know. But the thing was this here, man, prayer is an important thing. And sometimes God sends someone to remind us that, hey, I need you to check your prayer life. I need you to get your, your prayer game up, guys, don't clap too long. Now, y'all know how I am. Just one clap and let's keep it moving. I'm gonna, that's it, Brother Carl. He's saying, he's saying look, I, I need you to get your, your prayer game up. You know? So when we look at this thing, you might say, well, Phil, man, what is prayer? We know prayer is talking to God, right? But prayer is how believers of God talk to him. It is how we make our praise and our requests known. Through prayer, we are able to ask him for deliverance. We're able to ask him for mercy. We're able to ask him for healing. And we're able to ask him for miracles. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Guys, listen to me. I don't know where you're at tonight, no. Real talk. I, I really don't. I just really believe that God is really calling us to another level. We got some things that's happening, man. Wickedness is just all around us, and it's just like, man, what is going on? But, but God is still calling us, and he says, man, I need you to pray more. I need you to prioritize prayer. I remember uh, the other day when I was uh, giving, I think, the last chapel we'd done before uh, PCA closed out, and I was asking them, I said, man, by show of hands, how many of you uh, young people pray at least an hour a day? And uh, I can't remember if somebody raised their hand or not. So I asked, I said, how many of you pray at least 30 minutes a day? And I know y'all are worrying about if I'm asking the children that, but how many of y'all? Don't put your hands up. Just look straight ahead. I ain't going to know if you pray an hour or you pray one minute. But how many of you pray an hour a day? All right, my brother, just go ahead. You see how... <laughs> 
Good job, my brother. Pray for me, too. And I was talking to the kids, and I was like, man, how many of you, man, 45 minutes, 30 minutes? Maybe a few hands would go up. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, a few more hands would come up. Five minutes, a few of them came up and got down to one minute, a few of them raised their hand. But it was one little kid. He was in Ms. Cormier's class. He was, I think Ms. Cormier teaches what, three and four? Three and four year old. I asked, how long do you pray? I pray 55 hours a day. I say, ooh, Lord. I say, my brother, 55 hours a day, you got to cover his head because that child going to be glowing. You got to put him a little anklet on because he's going to be floating. He'll be just walking like, ooh, I'm just, you know, you know. 55 hours a day. And I just thought about it, man. It's, it's, it's sometimes, man, we get so busy. We get so caught up, man. We, we, don't, we don't make it a priority. And it's crazy. We don't make prayer a priority, but other things takes that place, right? Jeremiah says, call unto him, or call unto me. He says, I will answer thee. As I look through the scripture, man, I'm just reminded of, of our ancestors and our uh, great, 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 great grandfather and grandmothers and all of them, and, and throughout the scripture, uh, that they called on God, and, and they prayed to God in the time of need, and he answered. I'm, I'm reminded of Abraham when, when he prayed, uh, when God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God come up there, and he got his angels, and they're getting ready to wreck shop. They tell uh, 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 Abraham, he says, man, listen. He said, the wickedness of Sodom, man, has come up to me, and I got to handle this. I got to destroy it. And immediately, Abraham knew that, man, I got family living in Sodom. Man, I got family living in Lafayette. I got family living in New Iberia. Ooh, Lord, the angels might be taking care of New Iberia. No, I'm just coming. <laughs> We love New Iberia. period. But this is, the, <laughs> this is the thing. Abraham knew that if he don't begin to cry out to God and, and petition God, he know that his, his, his family is going, to end up, is, is going to end up dead. So Abraham, Abraham began to pray to God, and he asked God. He says, Lord, if there's 50 righteous in the city, would you spare it? And Abraham did something that I don't think a lot of us do. A lot of times we will go to God and we will pray and we will tell God everything that we want him to know. We tell him everything that we need him to do. We tell him everything. And then as soon as we're finished, guess what we do? We get up and we go, man, we pray the hour today. Not one time did we sit there and listen to see what God wanted to tell us. It's like you came up to me and said, Phil, I need you to do this, 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 and this. And then, all right. And I'm like, hey, wait. But the Bible says that Abraham, he asked God, he said, God, if, if, if there's 50 righteous in the city, would you, would you spare the city? And he listened. And God said, if there's 50, I'll spare the city. And Abraham began to think about it because he knew what was going on around him. He knew what was going on inside him. He knew the homosexuality. He knew the wickedness there. He knew the murder that was going on. He knew that no one really had a reverence for God over there. And he just said, look, hey, God, look, uh, I know I asked you for 50, but he, he's in, in his prayer. He's continuing to ask God. He said, how about if that's 40? God, would you, would, you, would you spare the city for 40? And we know how the story go. And he listened. I'm reminded of David when, when David said, let the, let the words of my mouth and the the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. How many times we sit there and we pray, but we never really sit and be quiet enough for God to speak back to us? Brothers and sisters, I really do believe that God, in this particular time that we're living in, God it needs to speak to us, and we need to be able to hear him and be able to decipher his voice. That's why tonight we're saying that Jesus is telling his disciples, man, prayer should be a priority. So we know the story goes on. Abraham is still talking to God, and I don't know how long he talked for. Some of them, some, you know, he, he, he might have talked for one minute. He might have talked for five. I don't know how long it took for him to get all his words out. But the length of time, it, it doesn't really matter. All God is saying, I need you to just step it up, whatever you're doing. So Abraham asked God, he said, man, what about 30? What about 20? God said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll spare it for 20. Abraham said, ooh, Lord, this talking to God is a good thing. Lord, how about 10? God said, Abraham, I'll spare it for 10. 
And then he said, God, how about fire? God said, boy, get out of my face. No, you know I ain't. You know I ain't. No, let me stop. <laughs> he didn't say that. But this is the thing. With him interceding and talking to God, God still handled his business. He still destroyed Sodom. But Abraham's family, guess what happened? We know that Lot and his family, they made it out. Why? Because he prayed and he talked to God. I'm, I'm reminded of, of, of Jacob's prayer. You know, when Jacob had then went off and he ran away from Esau because he had then stole a birthright and he'd been living at his uncle Laban's house and all that stuff. And now he got uh, four baby mamas, 12 children, and he coming back. and He's like, man, I got to get out of here. I'm coming back to the promise. You know, I'm coming back to where I'm supposed to be. But then he remembered. He remembered that his brother hated him so much that he was going to kill him when he see him. That was the last conversation that he had. He said, boy, I'm telling you, boy, when I next time I see you, it's on. I could see Esau now. He's just standing up there. Boy, I'm telling you, boy. When I see <laughs> That's how boy used to be in New Iberia. Let him stop. Let him stop. <laughs> but he said this here. He says, man, he began to pray to God. He says, God, listen, please spare my life. Don't let my brother Esau kill me. He prayed to God. And what did the Most High do? He answered his prayers. I don't know what your prayer is tonight. I don't know what the thing is that you are really needing God to do. Now, these prayers right here, a lot of prayers are out of desperation. But the thing is this here, I know this here for a fact, that the things that concerns me, it still concerns my God. He's concerned with, 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 with the things that I'm concerned with. So when I ask him for something, I know he's going to be faithful and, 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 and uh, give me the things that I, an, I ask for. Also, Moses' prayer. Now, let's just talk about Moses for a second because we're talking about our ancestors. Now, at this time that Moses prayed, he prayed a prayer of mercy. Now remember what happened, right? Our ancestors was locked up in Egypt. They were slaves. God delivered them. God parted the Red Sea on their behalf. They walked out there, man, full. Uh, they was paid. They went from being poor and broke to full of wealth. But even in that, God called Moses up to the mountain because God needed to talk to Moses about some things. You ever notice how God don't always like to speak to everybody in a big old crowd? He always wants you to pull them. He always calls them up to go in a special place to, for him to speak to. So he's speaking to Moses, and man, he, he gives Moses the, a few little rules, right? Some boundaries of the relationship that I have with them. Right? He said, okay, guys, listen to me, man. If we're going to be in a relationship, we have to set some boundaries. Right? We call them the Ten Commandments or we call them the, the laws and all that stuff. But God is just saying, look, I have called you up apart from all the other nations of the world. I need you to understand that I got to set some boundaries for our relationship. So Moses is all excited. He has heard from God. He had been talking with God. He had been praying. He comes down the mountain. He gets halfway down and all here. And Moses, look, all y'all ancestors wilding out, man. Y'all grandmother and your grandfather was wilding out, man. They doing all kind of stuff. They didn't took the money that God blessed them with. Now, that might have been my uncle and my auntie, but that was your grandmother and your grandfather. I'm just <laughs> They're out there wilding out. They took the blessings of God. They took the very thing that God blessed them with, the, the, the gold and all that stuff, and they got one of them brothers to make a calf, a golden calf that they could worship. God's people, the one that he, they just saw him split the Red Sea. The one that they just saw uh, all the miracles and stuff that happened to Pharaoh, right? Those people, only, this is what, what's probably within a couple of month uh, time span. Those people have forsaken the one true living God and turned themselves to idolatry. Guys, this is where we come from. And we can't be too hard on them, though. Because God has done so many things for us. God has pulled us out of so many different situations. And sometimes we find ourselves, what? We back in the very thing that he delivered us from. But this is the thing. Moses began to pray. Because God said, every one of them little coloreds down there, I'm going to kill them all. I, I can't. I'm going to kill them all. <laughs> them little coloreds. I didn't want to say them. them, them, them. But. <laughs> 
He said, I'm going to kill them all. And God was ready to completely destroy. But what Moses prayed, he says, Most High, please don't do that. He said, all they're going to say is that you delivered them from Pharaoh only to bring them out here to kill them in the wilderness. And God listened to Moses. Moses cared so much about his people. What? Let me ask you this here. How much do you care about your people? When we see young people killing each other every single day right around us, how much do we care about our people? Are we burdened with, 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 with the sin and the wickedness that goes on in our people like Moses that he would tell God, please don't hurt them, God, don't, don't kill them? Or are we just like, man, that's just, it is what it is. Do we even care now that when we see sin happen? Because when you look at Moses, man, he, he really had a, he, he, he heard it. It hurted him to see his, 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 his family members wilding out and all that stuff and, and knowing that the judgment of God was coming up on him. When Abraham knew what was going to happen in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, it hurted him. It moved him to begin to pray. The things that's going on around us today, are we moved to prayer for our people? Oh, we just, oh, it's just another one dead. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to step our game up in prayer. Another example, Hannah. Hannah was a woman that was stressing out. She was stressing out. She wanted to have children so bad, but it just seems that it wouldn't happen. But one thing about Hannah, she realized that, look, if anybody can make some changes in my life, it's going to be the most high. So Hannah, what she does, she goes to the Lord's house and she begins to pray. Now, the thing is this here. Did Hannah pray out loud or did she pray inside? We, we don't really know. But the thing was, it caught the priest's attention. The priest Eli was looking at her and she went, <laughs> you know, with the ugly face. You know how sometimes we try to get spiritual and we always have that face that, that looks like somebody passed gas or something, you know, like, and we feel sometimes the more our face is ugly, the more spiritual that we are. I don't know why we do that. But Hannah was so, so in deep agony because she really needed God to move on her behalf. That when Eli looked at her, he said, child, what's wrong with you, girl? It's too early to be drinking. He thought she was drunk. But Hannah said, no, I'm not drunk. I have been pouring out my heart to my God. And Eli told her, he said, well, let it be so. Whatever the prayer that you pray, that God would answer. And we know that a year later, Hannah, uh, she had her baby, and that was Samuel, one of the greatest prophets that our people has ever seen. The thing is this here. Are you praying or are you worrying? Because really you can't do both. And I'm going to tell you this here. Whenever we become so stressed out and we worry ourselves so much, we're saying that God himself is not able to meet the very uh, needs or he, he's not able to, to deliver to us the very needs that we have in our lives. And that becomes not an issue of, 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 of relationship or anything. It becomes an issue of trust, right? And God is saying, man, in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14, and we quote it all the time. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, not be as filled up with pride like the Pharisees and the scribes. He's saying, if you would just humble yourself and do what? And pray. Right? He say, and seek my face. That means we're spending some time with him. We're, we're, we're talking to him. He's talking back to us. We're, we're in a posture or position that we can actually... Tune in to what God is saying. We're not being so busy or so distracted that we can't hear God. He says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Look at the benefit here. He says, then will I hear from heaven, right? And I will forgive their sin and not only forgive their sin, but I'm going to heal their land. All he's asking for us to do is to humble ourselves and begin to pray. Why is it that everything else take more priority to us than prayer? Why is it that, that we can get 
Let's not get ahead of myself. Why is it that we allow other things to be more of a priority than prayer? Matthew 6, verses 6, again, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, the next part of the verse says, Enter into thy closet. Now, when I looked at this word, enter into thy closet, I'm like, oh, man, what? it has no significance to me when I first read it. But I looked at the, the Greek word of closet, it's uh, tamion, all right? It's a storage chamber, a storeroom, a chamber, an inner chamber, a secret room. Now listen to me. We Sometimes we read the scripture through these Western colonialized eyes and we think a closet is only made for clothes. But when Jesus was breaking this thing down to his disciples and saying, listen to me, I need to make sure that you are prioritizing prayer. He says, when you come into your closet, they knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew that there was a special place inside the home that they had designated for prayer. Man, we, in our modern times, man, we, we, we get ready to buy a house or, or we, you know, we, uh, we looking for a home or something. The, the first thing we want to know is uh, how many rooms, how many bedrooms, right? It's three bedroom, two bed, all right? So we have three bedrooms. Those rooms are made for the bed, right? We have two bathrooms, so that's made for bathing. Man, they got a game room. That's line yacht. Man, that's made for playing video games. Some of us, we got a theater room so we could watch movies and all this stuff, and we got the surround sound and big TVs, you know what I'm saying? We got a theater room, we have a living room, and in fact, the living room should have been for living, but it's just a place for gathering of the family. They got all these rooms in the house, but how many of us has a prayer room? A room that is designated specifically for prayer, a room that we can say, I'm going to get away from everything. Because Jesus told his disciples, he says, enter into thy closet. And if this was not a far-fetched idea to them, why? Because nobody refuted it. He says, enter into thy closet. Man, we are in the process of, of building a home. God has blessed us uh, to be able to build a, a new house. And we've been going through it. And we got to one of the rooms in the house, right? And my wife said, boy, this is going to be my prayer closet. And me as a deep spiritual minister that I am, I said, sweetheart, you got to be crazy. That's going to be storage right there. You're not, oh, no, we're not, we're not taking up all of this space, you know. And I didn't mean it like to say I don't want no prayer closet, but God convicted me right here. He spoke to me about this thing. He's saying, look, man, you're building that house. You better have a spot in there just specifically for me. So, look, you still can't have that spot. We're going to make another spot the prayer closet. But the thing is this here, again, where do we go when it's time for us to pray? Huh? Are, are, are we, you know, in our bedroom? Are we in the living room? Are we in the bathroom? Where, 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 is, where is your special place that, that you retreat to or you break away from when it's time for you to pray? Because God told his disciples, he says, man, look, I, I need you to to go in that closet. When, when I hear that, that enter into thy closet, it, it, to me, it's mean I need you to get away from everything. I need you to get away from, from them. I need you to get away from all the noise. I need you to come and be with me. I need you to have a spot, right, that you can come in there and you can sit down in there and me and you can discuss some things. It's got some things I want to talk to you about. He says, enter into thy closet. I think about the movie War Room. Y'all saw that movie War Room? If you hadn't seen it, man, it's, it's, a, it's a great film. Uh, and the main idea of the movie was that in this, in this film, there was an elderly woman that was looking to sell her house. And, and in the film, she was what you consider a prayer warrior, right? She knew how to talk to God. She knew how to connect with God. And she knew how to move the hand of God. When she needed something, she didn't go to man. She didn't go to, to, to this one or that one. She went to God. And she went inside of her little room that she had. Her, her, she called it her war room. Because she going in there and she going. It's, it's, a, it's a battlefield when she going in there. So she strategizing and all that stuff. But she had this little room that was her closet. And when I was studying this thing right here, 
The idea is she wanted to sell her house, right? And she had a great realtor, much like some of the realtors in this room tonight. And they're doing their, their normal, you know, showing of the house, telling them about the hardwood floors and telling them about the, the, the due fixtures and all this stuff that was in there. But the person at the end of the movie, she was talking to a retired minister, a retired pastor that wanted to move to the area. And at the movie, the woman is with the, the real, real estate agent, and, man, they're going through the house. But the husband, he comes to this closet, and he opens the door, and he just walks in. And he begins to look around. It's a little small, little closet, and he steps back out. And then he walks back in. He looks around again, and he steps Back out, and what he's doing, when he was doing this thing, it caught the attention of his wife and the real estate agent. She said, man, what are you doing? He said, this room right here? He said, somebody has been praying in this room. When he walked in that place, he said it feels, in the film, he said it feels as if prayer has been baked within the walls. Brothers and sisters, I got to ask you this here. When people walk into your home, do, do they feel that somebody been praying in here? Is it a feeling that comes over them and say, man, this place right here has been set apart for God's use. Is this place has been set apart for, 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 for me to talk to my God. Do, do people sense that when they come in to your house? And I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just asking you a question. Or they didn't feel that you have the best cable package, that you can have every sport known to man can be playing all, all screens at one time. When they walk into your house, do they, do they have a sense that, that the presence of God is here, or is it a sense of confusion and aggravation? When people walk into your home, what, what are they feeling? Right? Because remember, we have been called out of all the people in the world. When people walk into our houses, does it seem like we just like everybody else? What's playing on the television? What's showing on the computer? Is it things that's going to encourage us to, to seek God's face even more? Or is it things that's always constantly pulling us away? He says, enter into thy closet. The next verse, the next part of the verse, he says, and when thou hast shut thy door, he says, pray to thy father. Hold up, now I'm already in the closet. What is God is trying to, what is Jesus trying to convey to his disciples? He says, and when thou hast shut the door, which means to me, when I see that shut the door, he says, don't only just go in the closet. He said, at this point, I need you to close yourself off to everything. He says, right now, I'm saying, what is getting ready to happen is so very, very important. I need you to shut the door. I need everything. I need your full attention. Sometimes we go into an area to pray, but we're surrounded by distractions. God is saying, I need you to step it up. I'm calling you to get you a prayer closet. Go into your special place. And not only go into that special place, close the door. Shut the door, close it. Cut out and cut off all distractions. What are some distractions for you tonight? Or what are some distractions? What are some things that hinder you right when you get ready to get into prayer, man? That particular distraction come up. Talk to me, y'all, anybody. What, 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 well, let me not say y'all, but what can be a distraction to prayer? Cell phone, okay. But the cell phone is such a crafty device. I can find my scriptures on my cell phone. I can put on worship music from my cell phone. I also... If you're in the scroll only for five minutes on Facebook, and it turns into two and a half hours, and I'm still, boy, I really need to get to prayer. I really need to pray. Cell phones can be a distraction. What else can be a distraction? TV. I heard, I'm sorry, somebody said something over here? What's that? I'm sorry, say it again? Other people, yes. 
So let's talk about TV for a second. Now, I know that's none of y'all in here, but some people, they have their TV on 24 hours a day. That thing don't even cut off. Somewhere in the house, the TV is on. I don't know if they're scared of the dark or what it is, but when you're sleeping, why do you need to have the news on? <laughs> okay, some of y'all are looking down right now. I'm not I'm just looking at the, 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 the wall. God is saying this here, man. When you come into thy closet, he says, and when thou hast shut thy door, cut yourself off. Stop everything that's distracting you. Why? Because nothing is more important than you communicating with your God. Nothing. The cell phone is not more important. The television is not more important. The people. What people? Well, you get ready to go into your closet and you didn't close the door, so they... Daddy, what you doing? Mama, you sleep? <laughs> what you doing in there? You know? <laughs> I'm really getting in my word. I'm, I'm trying to hear from God. Okay, uh, the turkey got out the yard. <laughs> the dog got out the yard and the neighbor's calling the police. <laughs> All types of things at the wrong time going to come there to distract us. I really believe that, that the enemy sends distractions. Because he knows he can't really just blatantly get us to, to turn our backs from God or nothing like that. No, But he said, if I can just keep them so preoccupied that they have no time to, to, to spend with God, then guess what? They're not going to be able to hear from God. They're not going to talk to God. And guess what? All that doing is weakening them as a believer. And guess what? That all it is is that their salt is no longer salty. The salt is losing its savor. And if I can get them to a point that they're no longer seasoning and they're no longer salted, then guess what? They're not good for nothing. They're not even good for the master's use. So God is saying, when thou has shut, when thou has shut thy door. We talked about the TV. We talked about the cell phone. We talked about the people, even the computer, the tablet. You go in there, you put some praise and worship on it. And right when you get really into it and you're getting ready to start talking to God, you're boom. You forgot to turn the notifications off. Somebody just uploaded a new reel on Facebook. Now, I'm going to just check it out because I love me as my people. So, I'm going to just. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, the next video popped up. I didn't even hit the button. That thing just popped up the next one. Next thing you know, the next one pop up. And the next one pop up. And the next one pop up. And the minute me is just like, ha, ha, I got him right now. I got him right now. Ooh, let me give him some of this right here. Because I know Phil ain't going to watch no dancing. But let me put some Jamaican food or something on you. Oh, look at this cooking video right here. <laughs> he knows what you like. He has studied you. He has studied your parents. He, he, stud he knows what your weaknesses is. He, he looked at your whole lineage, where you came from. He knows what your weaknesses are. Yes. But God is saying this here. Those weaknesses, those distractions, I need you to cut them off, especially when you're spending time with me. Now, let's talk about another one. Have you ever been in prayer and man, prayer is starting to get good, right? You, you have blocked out everything. You left your cell phone in the bedroom. You out, you know, you, you were secluded. You're in this thing by yourself. Yeah, sleep is one. That's a good one, minister. Boy, I'm going to tell you all today, boy, I was preparing for, for this word right here. And man, I, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the computer and I'm looking at it. And uh, Praise God. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's not 7 o'clock yet. What time? Man, it's like, you know, I didn't go to sleep for a long time, but man, it's just like, bro. Oh, you'll be praying and then, boy, the meditation side, that's when you got to watch yourself. Because you've been praying and, you know, you try to pray a fast prayer, especially when you're tired. I want to hear what the Lord is going to say. Father, I'm listening. Yes, Lord. Keep your head up. Keep your head. Look to the hills from which come at your head. I receive it, you know. And we like, man. <laughs> but man, sleep is one, man, and, you, 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 and it's hard to fight sleep. So this is the thing, man, you should be able to set yourself. So of course, I had to call my wife. I said, babe, I'm, I know I said I wasn't drinking no energy drink. I need you to bring me something strong. <laughs> and boy, I was like this here on the computer, and the next thing you know, hell fire and brim, you are going to hell, and I'm telling you, and I got 
this burst. I said, I told her, I said, babe, I don't know if that's the spirit or is that the caffeine that just kicked in. I said, but ooh, it, it, it feels all right. So this is the thing. Man, we go to get into prayer, right? And we begin to pray and, and, and we just got started and we're trying to, you know, clear our minds and we're trying to think of everything that we can pray about. And all of a sudden we just, Father, I thank you that, who I hope I don't have to work late tonight. Where did that come from? All right, all right, let's, let's snap back. Hallelujah. Oh, most high God. Boy, that mortgage is high. Father, I'm, 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 I'm going to talk to my God. I'm going to prioritize prayer. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I just come. I wish my husband would have got a better job. If we, I wish I wouldn't have fussed at my children today. I shouldn't have gotten to it with my coworker. I know they didn't charge me. I know at Walmart I should have paid for that other little item. All kind of thoughts are coming into your head. When it's time for you to be focused on prayer, what do you do with that? What do you do when them thoughts is coming and, and you can't, it seems like you can't really control them? I'm going to tell you this here. Don't beat yourself up. Because sometimes those thoughts are into, into your mind. Why? Because subconsciously, those are the things that you are worried about. Those are the things that you are most concerned about. So guess what? You are in the prayer closet. You have cut off everything else. You have shut the door. Man, bring them things to the Lord in prayer. Father, you see what's going on with my finances. I really need you to turn these things around. You see what's going on with my children. Father, I need you to move on my behalf and get bold with it. Why? Because guess what? It's just you and him. God is saying, look, talk to me. Shut the door. Block out all distractions. When I find distracting thoughts interrupting my prayer time, I shouldn't resent myself for it. Instead, I should pay attention to what those thoughts are and talk to God about them. I often notice that my distracting thoughts, as I said earlier, are related to my deepest fears and anxieties that subconsciously pull me away from even Jesus throughout the day. Sometimes we can stress out so much about stuff. Somebody come to you with a scripture or encouragement. I don't want to hear that right now, man. I want to hear scripture when things are going good. And that things are, are pulling us away from him. But when I pray, he's letting them come to the surface so that I will give them to him. Guys, nothing that goes on in your life it's too hard that God himself can't take care of. All he wants you to do is to acknowledge that, look, man, we are in this relationship together. Man, give it to me. Stop trying to do everything on your own. Let's keep on going. The next part of the verse says, pray to thy father. Now, this one right here is key. Because a lot of times we look in the Old Testament and, and we, it's like God says, always says, I'm the father of Israel. Like the whole nation as a whole. And, and, and you know, it, it was like, you know, just a kind of blanket type thing. But Jesus is telling his disciples, he says, man, when you pray, pray to thy father. Now, what does that mean in, in just in our modern day language? What does that mean to pray to my father? I mean, I put, talk to the most high like you was talking to a parent. When I think about my parents and when my dad was uh, alive and my mom, you know, my mom's still alive, but when I would go there, man, I would, I would talk to him, man. We would clown. We, I would call him. He would call me. You know what I'm saying? We would talk, and especially at, at, the, at the end, we, our relationship was much better because, you know, when I was young, I was just like, oh, man, he work all the time. I don't want to. But at the end, though, I just begin to think about when I'm talking to my God, God is not this far away superpower that doesn't want to be bothered with me. But Jesus is telling his disciples, when you pray, man, pray to thy father. Some of you might have had a have a, a dad growing up, or maybe your your upbringing with your with your your biological father. Man, it wasn't that good. I looked at looked at a few scriptures just to see, man, how is it that how, how can we wrap our mind around this idea that we're praying to a parent? Galatians three twenty six, it says, "For all for you are." are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. 
He don't look at us as just like nobody or this, this dude that's just trying to get in my, get in my, you know, get in my way. I, I, he's saying, he says, man, look, man, you're my son. And I love you like a son. And if you didn't have a, a, a great parenting coming up, man, you really don't know maybe what that love feels like. But, but I know how it feels to be, to be loved by my mom and my dad. I know that when me and my wife, especially when we first got married, man, it was a little rough for us. We had to go to my dad one time, and I said, Dad, I said, man, me and my wife are a little short this month. He said, son, it ain't this month. This is your whole life. Mother Nature took care of that. That's why I stopped talking to him. That was one of the reasons, right? You always had a joke. I said, man, we are short on funds. <laughs> Look, Brian, look, 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 ooh, that was a good one. I'm going to use it. I, <laughs> I say, Daddy, man, we're we a little short this month. We need a few dollars to take care of the mortgage and the, and the light bill. And the thing was, I can come to my daddy without no kind of shame. And that, man, you're my daddy. And he would say, well, son, man, how much do you need? So I tell him, we need this amount. He said, boy, I ain't got no money. Go ask your mama. I'm like, Mama, don't even work. You're the one that worked. He always tell, yeah, I ain't got no money. Go ask your mom. But one night I did go in his wallet just to see if he was like that. I was going to help him out. But when I saw all them hundreds, I said, oh, that dude been lying to me all this time. <laughs> but the thing was, I went to my mom, and they was able to help us out when we, we needed some help. Why? Because that was a relationship there. We ate together. We talked together. We laughed together. And when I caught whippings or did something wrong, I, we cried. Well, we ain't cried together. I cried by myself. But the thing was... There was relationship there, right? So, so Jesus is telling his disciples, he says, listen to me, man. When, when, when you're talking to God, I want you to, when you're in your closet, I want you to talk to him like you're talking to a parent. Talk to him like you're talking to your mom or your dad. For 2 Corinthians 6, 18 says, and I will be a father to you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Romans 8, 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 4, 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. Guys, God is saying this here. He says, man, look. I love you with a love that sometimes your small, minute mind can't really comprehend. And we use these words, oh, agape love, unconditional love. Oh, I love unconditionally. Boy, let somebody do you something or look at you the wrong way. What happened to your agape? No, nah, we don't have that. But God is saying there's nothing that you can do really to stop me from loving you. There's nothing, no place that you can go to separate me from the love that I have for you. And God tells us, he says, man, while we were still in our sin." He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we didn't want to have anything to do with him, we didn't know who we were. We didn't know all the promises that he had already laid out for us from the beginning of time. And we wanted to be Gentiles. We wanted to be like everybody else. We wanted to worship the same thing they worship. God is saying, man, I loved you so much that I... Laid my son's down, son's life down just for you. He says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I don't know if you really understand what that really means. But what God is saying is here is that you are part of my kingdom. You are, a very, you are so special to me that I have an inheritance awaiting for you. I, you. You are so special to me that I have assigned angels to work on your behalf. Now, you are so special to me that, look, I'm, I, I'm, I am head over heels in love with you. Jesus is telling his disciples, listen to me. When you pray, I want to go back to verse 6. He says this here. He says, but thou, when thou pray, enter 
into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which see it in secret shall do what? Shall reward thee openly. Let's look at that last little piece for a minute. He says, for which in secret. That word secret right there in the Greek is, Greek is crypto. I say, ooh, Lord, that's kind of right up my alley right there. But it's where we get our word encryption from or just means secret or, or hidden. But God the Father is saying this here. Jesus is telling them. He says, man, when you talk to God like he's your father, he says, those things which you, which is in secret, thy father which see it in secret shall reward thee openly. I have in my nose the very thing that you spoke to me in the closet. These requests that was made in the private, the petitions that no one else heard, your deepest wants and desires that you have revealed to me, that you have not told anyone else. Jesus is saying those prayers are the ones that Abba will answer in a way that will cause others around you to know that he is God. The idea is this. They will not be able to figure out how you got that new car. The very thing that you went into the closet to, to pray about, the very thing that, that you needed, God said this here, man, what, what, are, what is the things that you need? Now that you have separated yourself from everybody else and you are here with me, guess what? The very thing that you asked for in secret, I'm going to bless you out in the open. Hey, man, they, they're not going to be able to figure out, man, how you got that new car? How did you get that new house? Well, you know your credit tore up, you got a 200 credit score, and they still approve you. That's Southwest funding. They still approve 200 credit score. That's a miracle from the most high God because you went into the prayer closet, okay? They're going to say, how you got that new job? You're not qualified. You don't even have a college degree. What are you doing being vice president of a major corporation? They're going to say, man, how do you get that new company, that new business? Because I went to my father and I began to pour out my heart to him. They're going to say, man, how, how, how is it that, that, that your marriage has turned around? How is it that your finances, as finances or fiancé, either one, one of them has changed. You had a wrong fiancé and God gave you the right one and your finances also changed. Okay, that's finances. I just wanted to make sure if y'all was up. How is it that your finances change? That you can tell them, man, I went to the most high in my prayer closet and he begins to, he began to do and move on my behalf. How is it that your health turned around? You were very sickly. Now you have been made whole. How is it that your family has changed? They went from being lost to now preaching the gospel. How is it that you, that your ministry has went to the next level? What was once just a local little Bible study is now being heard all over the world. Brothers and sisters, tonight, God is saying, I want you to prioritize prayer. Because when you do, I'm going to move on your behalf. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, I thank you so much. Lord God, that you would remind us, Lord God, how important prayer is. God, I thank you so much, Lord God, that you want to spend time with us. You want to hear the things that we have to say. God, we are, we are so thankful to you, Lord God, that you just want to be in relationship with us. Father, I pray now, Lord God, for all of my brothers and sisters, those that have put their trust in you. God, I pray that they would trust you like they never have before. That everything that they're worried about, everything that they're concerned with, that they would go into their prayer closet, okay? Father God, that they would get away from everything else and every form of distraction, God, and close themselves up, Lord God, to speak with you. And Father, I pray now that when they do their part, God, we already know that you're going to do yours, that you're going to meet them wherever they are. Father, I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters, God, that throughout this week, Lord God, that prayer would be the number one thing that they would seek after this week. Father, I pray that when they wake up in the morning, God, that they would begin to talk to you. 
Father, I pray, Lord God, that before they go to bed, Lord God, that they begin to talk to you. Father, even during the day when they're doing their business, oh God, I pray that they would talk to you, Father. And Lord God, as they talk to you, I also pray that they would listen and hear your voice as you speak back to them. Bless every person under the sound of my voice, most high, and bring our prayer level to the next level. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, I just want to thank you all so much for coming out to Bible study tonight. I just hope something that was said, it touched you because it really touched me. I really felt that God sometimes just needs to remind us that, man, prayer is important. And, you know, we'll just say, oh, man, everybody pray. But God is saying, man, I really want you to step it up. So let me pray a blessing on you guys and we're going to get out of here. Heavenly Father, we again, we just thank you for spending time with us tonight. God, I pray right now, Lord God, as we go out for this week, God, that this week would be blessed, that it would be anointed, God, that you would continue to fill us with your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. God, I pray that doors would be open, favor would be upon your people, Father, for the rest of the week. And Father, that these lights would shine and that they would get the attention of others. And all they would ask is, man, something, what is the thing that is different about you? And they can point them to you. Bless the rest of our time. I mean, bless the rest of our week, oh God, until we meet Sunday. Keep past and first lady and the family. Lord God, protect them and keep them. Watch over them. Let them be well rested. And Father, we're going to forever give you glory, honor, and praise. And we say this all in Jesus' name. Guys, thank you all so much. Y'all have a blessed rest of the evening. And we'll see you all on the next go-round.